Um, hey, everybody, welcome to the third lecture. Um, really excited to welcome Ben and Karin. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ben first. Um, so Benjamin uh, Freinger is co-principal and co-founder of the LADG um, with Andrew Holder, which they founded in 2004 and is located in Los Angeles. Um, and I guess between Boston also, where Andrew teaches. Um, the founders see their work as contributing to a longer history of ideas of craft that create unexpected solutions to conventional problems in architecture and design. The firm works at all scales with completed projects in California, Colorado, Hawaii, Minnesota, New York, Oregon, as well as the United Kingdom. The firm has received numerous professional honors and recognitions, including a Progressive Architecture Award, honorable mention in 2017 and 2018, and the 2014 League Prize from the Architecture League of New York as well as multiple citations um, from the Los Angeles chapter of the AIA. Ben um, has held positions at Monas and Partners Architecture in Munich, Germany, and Cohn Peterson Fox Architects and Planners in New York. Ben holds a BA in art history from Boston College where he studied after studying fine arts at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, Germany. Um, and he re received his master's of architecture from UCLA in 2005. Uh, where he has been a lecturer since 2018. Um, Karin um, <laughs> Liljegren is originally from New Jersey, but with Swedish roots, which is where the name of her office, Omgivning, oh um, <laughs> sorry, um, stems. Um, Karen founded her office, um, which means environment or ambience, in 2009. Um, her office is an integrated architecture and interiors firm that has a staff of over 40 people and has touched over 400 buildings from so small scale local cafes to 2 million square foot historic landmarks. The firm has become a leader in adaptive reuse of existing and historic structures in Los Angeles, putting new life in underutilized buildings and transforming them into hotels, multifamily housing, offices, restaurants and bars. In 2014, the firm received a presidential honoree award um, for an emerging practice from the AIA Los Angeles. In addition to her architecture firm, Karen is involved um, in the, and was the co-founder of a light fixture company that is involved in everything from design and manufacturing to distribution. Um, Karen received her bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of North Carolina in Charlotte before moving to Los Angeles, where she received her master's in architecture from UCLA in 1994. Um, thank you both for joining us, and we look forward to hearing about your personal and professional work. Great, thank you. Um, so, how, which order are we doing this? Shall I kick it off, or how will we? Yeah, I'm you should go for it. Okay, great. Um, Karen, nice to meet you, and looking forward to talking with you. Um, I'm gonna try to keep this rather brief. I know we all say that every time we open up a lecture, and then. By the end, everyone is fidgeting in their chairs. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid that and hopefully um, set the tone for some interesting questions here. So let me screen share and get um, this talk up and running here. Great. We're good. Wonderful. So um, thank you, Yulia, and the department, of course, for, or, for having me here today. Um, and I guess I'll just open by saying, so why am I here today? Um, again, hopefully it's less about talking and more about initiating questions relevant to the current academic and professional climate in which we operate. Um, so then briefly, who am I and who is the LADG and, and how did we get started? Because I think it may be relevant for some of the students. Um, so, uh, the LADG. Uh, we have an office here in Los Angeles and another in Boston, um, where my business partner, Andrew Holder, is teaching at the GSD. Um, and yes, we were part of the class of 2005 here at AUD. Um, so the, the foundational of, idea of our practice, um, you might say, was born here at UCLA. Our firm is uh, definitely a child of the school. We are obsessed with both possible theories of architecture, things like character, and by the nerdiest technical details of how it's made. So the contemporary conversations on affect, on formal complexity, on the graphic, on the easy and on the difficult, all of those have roots at this school. Um, and I would say that the early years of LEDG may to some extent have been an extension of that studio culture. Um, so 
uh, how did we start? Um, at first, oop, I need to, there we go. At first we build. So as, as students, we were arrogant and we thought that the best way to begin a practice in architecture was to start our firm as third year MARC ones. So the LADG is really a corporate name for two persons who made a pact to follow a simple recipe. And that was graduate, start a firm, build and keep building until the record of your impact on the world is, is sort of an accredited mountain of objects. And for the first seven years, we were single-minded in this pursuit. We pushed everything else out, no competitions, no paper architecture. We scarcely even made renderings, only the production of physical stuff. So what happens next? So we research a little bit. Um, and for us, research is also building. So except that that it differentiates itself from what we might call proper architecture um, by scale, by purpose, and perhaps a few other factors that we can come back to in conversation a bit later. And, and sort of how does this happen? So you work for a few years, uh, you're bold enough to throw your hat in the ring blindly and kind of hope for the best, um, enter some competitions, get funded, et cetera. Maybe you lecture a bit, you get published, you teach, although I personally didn't teach for a very long time and eventually you get invited to some things. So this, um, this slide and this project in particular, MoMA's PS1 Young Architecture Program competition is a good example of that. Um, we never actually won this. Um, we were nominated to submit entries twice. And even if we didn't win, we might say that these entries are a good way of kind of tracking the progress of the firm for us. So I'm not going to, to linger here too long, except to point out, um, we have a great deal of discomfort with these proposals. Um, in fact, maybe it's it's more precise to say that we have a discomfort with the competition itself. Um, it's because the competition lacks kind of resonance in the outside world. And the forum lacks the everyday life contaminants, which typically facilitate a rather traumatic change during the design process that either elevates a project or stifles a project. At least that's how we see it. So. Maybe another way to say this is that the litmus test for what I would call good work is the ability of any project to survive the internal contaminants of client or program, or as it relates to some of our later built work, the contextual contaminants of the LA building landscape, which these contaminants can be bureaucratic in nature, or they can actually be physical attributes for adjacency, site conditions, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> our work thinks about architecture as a sufficiently dense accumulation of things, uh, the assemblage of medium sized chunks that cohere as plausible shelter. You might say the conventional litmus test, which makes them identifiable as architecture to our critics. Alone, the components are underwhelming, unrefined, and sometimes maybe over refined. They may register as awkward, overly precious, clunky, or misshapen. Um, and really what holds them together is an interest in the character of the part or the detail. So for us, character preserves organizational coherence in the absence of ideal form. Um, I should say, so MoMA PS1, um, and I, I didn't introduce some of these projects. I'm going to be a little sloppy here. This is Loftways, one of our first projects here in Los Angeles, just a, a manufactured interior. This is uh, Surefoot Santa Monica, one of our first clients uh, right out of graduate school. We did 15 stores for this client across the country, um, consisting of like highly articulated um, design prefabricated interiors um, on, a, on a budget of zero dollars, incidentally. Um, this is MoMA PS1, our competition entry in 2018. And this I believe is 2019. Um, this was Giant Jai Gallery, um, uh, an exhibition that we did in downtown Los Angeles at Giant Jai Gallery in, boy, I think this might have been 2018 as well. Um, and then this is our project for Coachella. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about what the, the context for this project was later. Um, so to expand on this, I would argue that if our world is crowded with objects, then our brand of architecture need not begin with the design of space or organization in the abstract. Um, a crowd of physical things can fit together in very particular ways to produce 
space and organization as secondary, residual, and emerging qualities. Um, we sort of might call this starting down one road and stumbling across a, an unanticipated solution while bearing in mind there is no such thing as accident. Architecture requires attention, intention rather, it can never be involuntary. A happy accident really becomes intention when it is rigor rigorously interrogated and repurposed as architecture um, and specifically when it is reproducible. It is manifested in the slippages, the misfits and gaps between objects that seek loose affinity with one another as much as they do with their audience. Um, so in this scenario, familiar programs gain new resolve and attention as they are squeezed between the physical artifacts that support them. So new programs emerge with sort of a happy, uh, with happy survival strategies as, as again, as interrogated accidents. Um, I can kind of explain this using one of my favorite metaphors, which is that of grandma's attic. That is, like, if you want to live in a cluttered attic, which is for us Los Angeles, it requires a nuanced and thoughtful approach to all the things lying around. So our brand of architecture employs a similar approach at the scale of a retail interior, a house, or even at the scale of a city block. So Los Angeles has proven to be sort of the ideal testing ground for this. Um, or you, you might also say that we all effectively live in grandma's attic already. And if we are committed to adaptive reuse of our environment and the elements already in it, then the city is a dense place and it is only getting more dense and we want to be respectful stewards of the city and our neighbors. Um, so maybe that kind of leads into what are we working on and what are we doing now? Um, so here's what we're interested in uh, right now. Um, so for us, like to return to grandma's attic one more time because I just love it so much. Um, the stuff that's laying around our attic is, is in a found state. It's composed largely of dissembled parts, buildings, architectural assemblies such as roof. However, apart from wall, which is the stuff which constitutes raw tectonic goods from which we imagine the near future of Los Angeles will be constructed, at least in terms of residential architecture and houses. So these reconstituted raw goods have the capacity to organize space, again, mining slippages, gaps, and misfits. However, they also have the capacity to escape this role as agents of decoration and ornament in service of new cohesive whole assemblages. So we're asking how will Los Angeles densify as its population grows and the city hits the geographic and psychological limits of lateral sprawl. And also how will Los Angeles afford density? Um, so I want to open this for conversation by referring to a recent inquiry we received in the office that kind of shed light on what I think is an apparent disconnect between the world of the architect and the client, certainly the world of the academic architect and the more consumer based client. So this is an email um, I, I got sort of in the blind a couple of months ago from a gentleman named James. Um, and I kind of, it's a little fuzzy, so pardon me, but I, I circled some of the relevant points, what I think are the relevant points. Um, James wants to build a home. What's, what's interesting me, to me about James is that even though I can presume he's never built a home before and he's new to this, but the information contained in this email is largely correct. That is, James's budget is approximately in line with the prevailing costs of construction in greater Los Angeles. So the conclusion is the cost of construction in Los Angeles all but eliminates past notions of private ownership for already diminishing middle class citizens. Um, so despite this, we would still argue that the site of densification paradoxically will be the single family parcel. However, rather than working on the problem of cost from the top down, we're proposing the inverse to address the problem through alternate modes of acquisition, ownership, and new modes of living. The method will not be a, a wholesale modernist clearing out, but more uh, a piecemeal one at a time addition of accessories and subdivisions into smaller fragments. The population will be atomized, desirable bits of, form of the former family block, such as artists and all manner of persons who desire to live above garages, um, 
and more generally, increases in density will try to hybridize these two conflicting fantasies about Los Angeles past um, as a way of projecting a possible new version of the city. Uh, so in the first of these fantasies, Los Angeles retains a sprawling looseness of Rainer Banham's or Furbia or Plains of Id, where each family claims a plot to construct a tiny fortification for their own private versions of home life. And in the other, Los Angeles retains a nostalgia for its past as a hippie mecca, a place where the source family is opposed to the regular family, I guess, uh, the self-realization fellowship and other would-be utopia builders could experiment with collective living outside the strictures of one plot, one family suburban development. So the challenge for architecture in this scenario is to produce novel forms of inhabitation that similarly hybridize LA's suburban and utopian legacies. I'm going to, uh, I think I need to pick this up. So I'm gonna move quickly and run down a couple of examples and then try to stitch this thesis back into the kind of some of our more recent built work. Um, so each of the houses that I'm going to show may be seen as the catalyst or the consequence of our LA thesis. Um, starting with uh, kind of house one, this is um, here in Los Angeles and recently completed. Um, I, I like talking about this project for the very simple reason um, and certainly for students uh, in that it, it can't be understood easily in plan or section alone. It also can't be understood in a single image. Another way to think about this is to return to the notion of raw tectonic goods that I introduced earlier where roof and wall are liberated to perform independent functions and develop simple codependent relationships with other stuff on the site. So what does that mean? It just means that a roof plan a section and a floor plan are inherently divorced. Yes, they have continuous vertical points of reference, but they all play slightly different roles tectonically. Um, so moving on to kind of a description of the project, um, it's a residence and studio for two artists, a painter who works in large format. Um, he's a kind of well-known muralist. They, they want to remain anonymous, so I don't talk about them in great detail. They're kind of a a very eclectic, interesting couple that way, um, and sort of a bit, a bit recluse. Um, it, what's interesting, and, it, and it's for uh, his partner, a photographer, um, who actually develops a great deal of film on site. And one of the components was to, to include a dark room in the project brief. So what's interesting about this is this is kind of a common LA phenomenon. Um, we have a landlocked parcel. Uh, a compound of sorts. There is an existing collection of buildings on the site. It's a compound surrounded by everyone else's backyard in effect. Um, our precedent is deeply rooted in the mid-century suburban expansion of Los Angeles um, and a magazine collection of homes designed by Cliff May. They have readings like model number 3215 and some of the planimetric operations in this project um, take kind of direct cues from this kind of organization. Um, so there is only one plan here. Um, and what fascinates us about the Cliff May plan is the way that walls and interior elements appear to float free on the ground plane, allowing for the emergence of figure in the association of rooms with otherwise mundane functional uses. So walls operate as freestanding objects collected loosely under roofs, the roof is partially dis disassociated. There is an adjacency of perceived complementary functions of rooms. Um, we've sort of extracted the plan figures from May um, and repurposed them, or maybe a simpler way to say that is we, we've turned them inside out. And that conventional program is sort of smeared across the site in our version. Um, it's an, an inversion of the architectural cliche to bring the outdoors in, as here everything is already inside. Um, the project is all interior. The walls are arranged across the site to imply interiors, interiors that can be interpreted as extending in all directions. In plan, there is no absolute sense of what would be outside the arrangement of walls. There is no single elevation. On the exterior, uh, is this the one that I'm looking for? I, here we go. On the exterior, 
Only glimpses of exterior volumes and figures are framing the open spaces. And on the interior of the studio, it's again, it's, it's all elevation. Um, the indoors are brought out as walls begin to define the in-between spaces under loose fitting eaves, under wallowing roofs. And in between the new and existing structures on site, we get a kind of macro scale living room where walls begin to do work as site furniture. Um, so uh, the sections in this project are an attempt to test our hypothesis, whether these effects have achieved that we've achieved in drawing could appear in the experience of the house. Um, the project was conceived in plan, however, interrogated through section, we wanted implied interiors, no absolute sense of what's outside versus inside the arrangement of walls. Um, we want to uh, plan accountable to section, an increased sense of interiority heightened by the loose fit of roofs. We wanted a collection of things that's sufficiently dense to make a building, where space is the residium or the thing that is left behind. Um, and then, yeah, this is the, the area of view, I think, where you can perhaps best register the project, which again, back to my opening comment about this project, is also an, an artificial view that can't be seen conventionally by simply experiencing or occupying the house. It has to be captured by drone or some other means. <clears throat> the second project, um, so this is uh, house five, uh, also here in Los, Ange Los Angeles and actually finishing up construction this week. Um, so of all of our more recent works, uh, this is kind of a unique project. It has a, a unique relationship to climate. So uh, cl not climate, excuse me, to client. So perhaps unlike PS1, which I talked about earlier, which effectively exists in a vacuum, House 5 represents the antithesis. It's a consistent negotiation between built constraints, i.e. the conceptual project and the client brief, um, the clients seen here, uh, Darren and Danielle, they are new, new parents. So they're kind of nuclear, um, serial Angelina homeowners, and they are also patrons interested in a less normative view of architecture kind of outside the mainstream. So they want a single family home. We've done our best to deliver something slightly more. Um, so for instance, we've opened the house brief by evacuating the center so that the kitchen which occupies the space is quite literally outside. And conversely, at the periphery, open, openings invite engagement with the discrete interior objects and programs under the roof. Um, the project is uh, also kind of very insular. It sits on a quiet residential street near Larchemont Village. Um, it's not a hillside lot per se, which uh, a lot of our other projects are. Um, but many of the organizational tactics that play in the hillside research come into play in this project. And I'll return to that a little bit later. Um, so this is the street view again. Um, there is kind of an overwriting of the brief with technique, which extends to the client relationship with the neighborhood. So what we're asking is, how can we stitch a contemporary house into this context? Um, nearly everything is new with the exception of the existing exterior or 50% of the existing exterior walls as required by code to keep the project entitled as a remodel and to maintain existing non-conforming elements and to borrow also subtle, uh, subtle, subtle rem remnants of the original four square plan organization, which we rather liked. Um, let me see if I can get to the facade. This is the original building facade. This is a study that we produced of the Kind of facade in context. And then I'll try to get back to this is the again the facade under construction here. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but in any case, um, we we couldn't really hide this house. That means the the to contextualize the facade, we kind of attempt to match roof lines in the style of the neighborhood to produce a sort of diagram of appropriateness. Um, and, and again, we can't do it. So how is the, the project organized? Well, we, we have to kind of break it down by components. And so we have three discrete elements operating in plan, all based on a loosely expanded four square DNA of the original house seen here. Um, we have parenthetical walls. We have freestanding objects. We have little rooms under shed roofs. 
In other words, so here the contaminants of context present in greater LA, um, the unlike the, the kind of contaminants present present in greater LA and some of the other projects here, perhaps the original four square plan is the contaminant. So it's the thing that we need to grapple with and wrestle with in order to produce this new piece of architecture. Um, the site strategy is kind of porous front to back. Setbacks are repeated in the middle with a, a cut straight through the center line of the house. There are transverse openings. The diagram acts uh, as a, a vehicle for us to kind of think about the client preferences relating to the other systems of organization. So there are three bedrooms. Um, there are specific definitions of privacy and entertainment. The house is 2000 square feet. It's constrained largely to the footprint of the existing, pre-existing house rather, with the exception of the extension of plan to produce organizational uh, properties to the remaining site area. So in this project, there's kind of a high degree of plasticity with extreme, with an extreme range of shapes and plan. The early schematic design consists of 3D prints in the form of unfolded boxes. Quite literally, the section is a, a stack of three things. Ground stuff, extruded walls and solid boxes, single pitched wedges, an unfolded box that stitches solids together and encloses a rem remaining object sits on the top. Um, so for us, I might say in relation to this project, um, insufficient means are a good thing. So the roof box kind of perched atop those objects is trying hard to do its job. Its effort is being expended on behalf of the client. And I would argue on behalf of the imperfect fit between means and ends which produces all the beautiful excess. So for instance, the windows and clerestory openings that make the interior kind of look like a church. The design equipment we bring to the table is a collection, a collection of solid objects, wedges and cubes, and unfolded boxes based on a brief in a, a belief in discreteness as a means for establishing a new, a new cohesion of stuff. So I think it's important to note here that we are not trying to undercut the client's wishes or to overanalyze or over deliver the project, but this is the mental equipment that we have to wrestle with their design brief. These are earnest attempts to satisfy client requirements, but always produce effects. And we were interested in mining those effects to their ends. So there's kind of a productive misfit between architect and contractor and client here, and the design gets virtually uh, as the design gets further spatialized and, and misregistration continues to play out here. Um, kind of an early, relatively early in construction view from the, the front yard. Again, it's it's a house for entertaining, but it it shows kind of a relatively blank facade to the front. It'd be great if you could wrap up soon. Sorry. I'm working on it. I'm going to wrap it up right now. I'm just realizing that too. So um, yeah, let me just kind of cut to the chase here and get to the... Um, let's just conclude with this. And, and I'll say um, there's some just views of the interior, et cetera. And kind of where the where the state of, of construction of the house now, which is again just a few days away from wrapping up. So, uh, just in conclusion, uh, from my perspective, once being a student, I, I guess I would like to know what do the students think about all of this. Um, hopefully, you have questions not not about the talk per se, but about the larger questions about um, sort of our discipline, or maybe we could call it an industry. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and then I'm um, happy to answer some questions later as we as we continue. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. And Ben, can you stop sharing? Then I can... Yep. So thank you. And I think this is great because mine's going to be totally opposite. So it's always nice to have totally different presentations, right? Um, mine's really more focused on um, less of my work and more of a career path or just like weird things in life that take you in different directions. So I'm literally going to start, oh wait, 
Um, I'm literally going to start with, I was born. <laughs> I grew up in a very, very average, super middle class, New Jersey, suburban, super boring life. <laughs> and I was obsessed with New York City. And that kind of set the stage for, you know, kind of like where I came from. So again, UNC Charlotte, UCLA, uh, both architecture programs. This was late 80s, early 90s, uh, hence the, you know, different vibe from back then. So after UCLA, um, and also it was a recession, but I was really lucky to get a job. I was at KFA and they focused kind of on housing and we, we were able to get the first adaptive reuse project in Los Angeles. There, there was a new ordinance that um, was just implemented and we got the first project. And then from then I spent, uh, let's say that was 99. So uh, those 10 years kind of um, growing in that firm and uh, ended up overseeing our adaptive reuse projects. And I think there was like 12 historic high rises that I converted to mixed use housing. So those 15 years were building up my chops, getting tons of experience. Uh, I had really awesome bosses that saw potential in me and just let me go with it. Um, and we were all kind of growing and learning together as their firm grew. I was growing and they just kind of let me have at it. And so having bosses that allow you to, to be who you are um, is super important. So 2009, I started Om Givening. And at that point, I had, again, spent 10 years focused almost exclusively on revitalizing downtown Los Angeles and Hollywood and converting these old buildings. And I really wanted to continue that process and kind of amp it up to the next level. I really wanted to integrate interiors with architecture because I was starting to see a real shift in our industry becoming very separate. Um, this was also, you know, height of the recession and I just became a single parent recently divorced in 2008. Um, but thank God this house that we built together, uh, we sold it right before the recession. And so we had a big chunk of money and my half was what I started my firm with and basically had no income for three years because if you start a firm in a recession and you don't have family money, that's what you gotta do. <laughs> so uh, talk about diving in without really knowing what you're you know, up against. I think everyone who's a business owner will attest to that's what it is. Um, anyway, but today, yeah, we have about 35, 40 folks. Um, we have a nice diverse staff. I, it's great. A uh, lot of diversity and women leaders. Um, it's still 100% woman owned, but I've been, we were almost making a big change with that until COVID hit. So I'm um, giving, so our project, our, our process, our projects, our goals is all about kind of un uncovering potential. So it's in everything. It's in the people in our staff, it's in the, the users of our buildings, um, uh, the spaces, the buildings, the communities, like how, what, what can we find? What is that potential that with our creative brains we can see and with our technical abilities we can execute and make, make happen? Um, and I think our general approach is super macro to micro. So on the macro side, we're super involved in policy and advocacy because uh, a lot of times what you can actually build stems from policy. And a lot of times architects don't get involved in that, but I, I highly recommend understanding policy and codes because we're, you know, we're the only ones with boots on the ground that really understand what works, what doesn't work. So we've, we, we've, we're, we're diving in headfirst, um, especially with adaptive reuse policy reform. Um, and then of course, on the macro side, not just the building, but how does the building impact uh, the street, the neighborhood, the bigger community. It's not just the building. Um, and then down to micro, so it's all those details. And it's really about human-centered design. What, what does this feel like for the human? How are they moving? What are the, you know, how, how can you enhance well-being and social connections and all that kind of stuff? So just two, a couple of projects really quick. Um, on the, the really big scale is Sears Landmark Building, which is um, you know former distribution center, uh, Sears distri Distribution Center that was built uh, in a series from the 20s through the 60s. And um, so our job was, and it's historic, so to con convert it to over a thousand units, uh, residential units, 200,000 square feet of office, 60,000 square feet of retail and food hall, um, and so, um, you know, 
it, it was just massive. <laughs> and, you know, it's just as, as, a, as a box to be able to, to put housing in there is, is quite a feat and very expensive. And there's so many talk about policies and historic regulations of what you can do and what you can't do. You know, we were carving in all these huge light courts into the building and you know, how that works, how that doesn't work. But what's, what was really fun about this was how, how you could carve into the thing and really break down that mass and create this totally living organism of all these humans. I mean, you think about there'd be thousands and thousands of people in this building every day and how they would interact with each other, whether it's through circulation, through views, through the light courts, um, and really kind of carving into on, on many levels. That was really fun. Um, and then we do a lot of uh, historic uh, adaptive reuse, right? So this is one that's about to open. I don't have any good pictures. Literally this month, proper hotel in downtown LA, um, you know, just really exciting to see stuff like that happening. And then on the small scale, we do a lot of restaurants, bars, retail, um, you know, kind of designing everything A to Z, um, designing the furniture, designing uh, light fixtures and stuff like that. And it's just, and, and really working with the brand of what is, uh, what is that coffee shop? What is that interest, um, that, um, that, uh, that bar, that restaurant? So really understanding their brand, their identity, and trying to bring it through in the interiors, which is hard to do because you know, you, you really have to be in tune with them as opposed to imposing what you want to do. Like you have to make all that kind of work together. Uh, last year I became um, FAIA, which is a really great um, status thing, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> uh, it was a, a very awkward application process because you basically have to document every single thing you've done in your entire life. Well, maybe not the early years. Uh, like, uh, but um, to prove that you have made an impact on the profession. And it was, it was uh, you know, if, if, if you don't have a big ego, it, it's, it was kind of a, a difficult thing to, to, uh, to do. Anyway, this was a diagram that we did to kind of show the, you know, my impact of downtown LA. And it basically it's showing, you know, on the left side, the history of downtown Los Angeles and then the, the fill that kind of moves up and down is kind of showing the occupancy of the buildings. So you know, the historic core in downtown was super active in the 20s, 30s, 40s through the 60s, and then it really tanked and was almost completely empty. I mean, it's, it's shocking how empty these buildings were in especially the 90s. And then um, you know, first through KFA and then through I'm giving kind of the impact both with execution of projects, but also policy reform, stuff like that. Um, so then I have all, again, all these other endeavors that I'm going to try to pull together in the end in this other diagram to explain, because it's, I think that I would probably describe myself, I'm still an architect, absolutely, you know, because uh, once you're, you know, if you're an architect, you're always an architect, but I don't practice architect, certainly not like Ben, right, very different. I would say that I'm more of a creative entrepreneur and I'm not really, I mean, I'm, I'm not really drawing that much anymore. You know, I have this amazing staff and, and they're doing that. And so my creativity has moved more into like all these different endeavors that can be integrated together. So there's light fixture company. Um, there is a lot of uh, prototypes because uh, in the future, part of my plan is to have, uh, you know, be able to do a product and sales of the product, whether it's just to our projects or to a larger audience, I don't know yet, but in, in every project we're trying to do that custom work so you can kind of work on the details, work on execution, test things out, what's working, what's not working kind of thing. And then development, uh, doing real estate development is a very big part of what I've uh, been wanting to do for a long time. Um, COVID put a little bit of a another hold on that. <laughs> But um, right now we're trying to buy a building and move our office into that. But instead of the traditional, oh, you know, I'm just going to move, you know, as my architecture firm, I'm going to buy a building, you know, and make some money and save some money kind of thing. Um, the idea is more of a, a blend of not co-working and not private offices, but um, a blend of the two. And uh, I won't go into all the details, but um, again, always trying to figure out how can we find potential, you know, what how can you find potential in a development model that works for a tenant, allows for growth, 
incorporates what we've learned from COVID in terms of hybrid working is going to be the future, sharing spaces to be more economically viable and things like that. Like, how can we always think about that? Um, and last year, you know, yeah, we had a, a huge, uh, still having a huge decrease in uh, billable work. And we put a lot, thank God for the PPP money from the government, which really kind of helped us float for a while, but um, put a lot of our efforts that we had time for into design reports, you know, really looking at, you know, how things are changing, trying to communicate to potential clients, to our own um, industry, outside of our industry. Um, and then uh, um, on the right, um, a lot of the policy reform that we were able to, to, to really dive in deep to deep into. And then it was fun, ta you're talking about the, the densifying Los Angeles. So that's always been one of my goals um, and, and the how I made the, the money when I got divorced that I could take to start my company. Um, I, I really believe in densifying Los Angeles at least one house at a time, if not much greater than that. But uh, so the mayor's office just did this housing competition. It's called Low Rise. Um, we won two categories, um, and this one was about subdivision, which is basically taking that single family lot. I'm not sure if you can see my arrow or not, but like the front in the yellow showing an existing single family home with little to no modification, maybe a small addition to get a little ADU there. Um, and, then, uh, and then subdividing the lot uh, to literally create a second parcel to be able to do duplex on the back. And then um, in order to you know, rethink how our communities work to really integrate more community aspects and this idea of you have your private space, but you also have your shared space. So for example, the, like on the right, that's showing, that's just your standard, you know, single family home, like no modification, but making the front yard instead of unutilized, make it um, their private outdoor space. And potentially it's just showing like a little kind of containerish thing that would be a, um, a commercial accessory unit, something small, like maybe 10 by 10, but you could have your office there and it's on the street, you know, or you could sell tamales on Sundays um, or candles you've been making, you know, or something, some aspect of commerce to integrate and that these swaths of, of green could be urban agriculture that a uh, community land trust um, uh, manages. Um, and, that, and also that parcel can sell or lease that property. So they're also getting a little bit of income from that. And then the space in between the two buildings, the green space in the middle. So that would basically be common area for all four residences then. So through like an easement so that you can have larger gatherings and those are more common. So that's like the shared space. So just in terms of like all these different endeavors, um, Yes, it's a lot and it's totally overwhelming and I'm not succeeding at all of them because there's too many. <laughs> and then things like COVID happen and throw curveballs that you're not ready for. But, you know, this is kind of um, the diagramming that I had done um, a few years ago, like two, and it's actually not that far off. But the idea is I wanted to create a different model in an architecture firm that isn't the traditional model. And it's about these smaller entities, smaller businesses that, um, you know, uh, that, that say, for example, one um, giving person might have a bunch of different interests that they spend their time on and how we could help facilitate uh, for those interests to become into money making and, um, and fulfillment making opportunities. So, for example, maybe this person's into graphic design and they're really good at, at designing graphics and with our resources and our projects, we can you know, create a fabric line through one of our vendors, you know, and that they could get royalties through that. You know, or certainly the developed model, the idea is you, you put in time in the beginning and sweat equity, which is what we're working on right now. And then that sweat equity comes into small ownership, which then can hopefully grow and balloon. Um, and just trying to figure out how to, again, create potential for people. And I do think that people more and more are gonna have multiple things in their lives that they're potentially interested in. And so this is the, the culminating interstellar diagram, we, interstellar map, we call it, which can really scare people, but um, it's, it's not about, uh, maybe it's chaos theory, but really it's just about everything can integrate and interconnect with each other to help, to help each other out, you know, or to provide a resource or to provide a connection or to buy something from. 
um, which can really help us all grow and do better at what we're good at. And that's my story. Great, thank you guys so much. It was really interesting to hear you guys speak back to back. Um, I'm gonna try and combine my questions with some of the questions the students have. Um, so you both very, okay, at least it, from my perspective, from what you guys showed us, you have kind of differing perspective, let's say on the role mm -hmm. of the architect and Maybe not, maybe that's not true. But it seems like Ben, you in, in the LADG, you guys seem to have a very specific interests that in each project you're really trying to delve into. And then Karen, you talked a lot about trying to explore the uh, desires of the client more. And but then you also talked about your own personal work and how you try to inc include that into as many of your projects as possible. So I would just be curious how you guys see that relationship between yourself and what you're interested in and the desires of the client. And then also, I guess, kind of <coughs> on another side, how do you even get clients? This question from the students, like how do you get your name out there so that people even know to come to you for a specific thing? Sorry, Karen, do you want to take a crack at that or should I take a crack at that first <laughs> well, one? I'm going to start backwards if that's cool. Like, how do you get clients? Because yeah. um, the, the first part was might be harder for me to answer. Um, uh, yeah. And, okay. Actually, maybe I would say, for, I wouldn't say my, my, my desire is, is client-based. I would say it's kind of, it's, it's omni. It's like everything based, right? It's, it's like trying to trying to, to make everything work. It works for the client, it works for the site, it works for the community, it works for the user, it works for uh, financially, it works for us financially, which is kind of hard to do. Um, you know, it has to kind of work for everything. Um, in terms of getting clients, uh, you know, I'm, again, our work is really different than Ben's, but it's, I mean, for us, because it's more community-based, it, it's really being involved in the people in the community. So it's the people that live there, the people that work there, but who are the, who are the operators? Who are the, the, the people doing business there? Who are the developers doing work? Um, who's involved in the city? Um, and then once, once you actually have something to, to, to give value, right? So for us, it was the adaptive reuse experience. Once I got those 15 years at KFA, I had value to give. Um, you know, I didn't pop out with any value. It really took a long time to provide that. And then, and then it's, it's about nurturing relationships. And then those relationships that you nurture plus something you can provide as value come together and kind of just naturally grow. Yeah, I can use that as kind of a way to segue into the part one question too. But I think nurturing the relationships is a short answer. I, I would love, and we we're trying to, and, and love the idea that people approach us because they say, we want one of those. Um, but what we sell is something that's very specific and nuanced, hopefully not bespoke, at least maybe in the past it was bespoke and it's increasingly moving to something that's a little more, um, I don't want to use the word attainable per se, but we're, we're conscious of that. Um, and maybe that's a good way to then segue into the conversation about what is the architect? Like, who is this architect that we keep talking about? And what is the role of that? So Karen used an interesting word, omni, that it's like, you, you, we want to check all of the boxes, the client brief, the design, like all of those things. Um, and it's sort of been my experience that that's not possible without friction. And a little bit of friction can actually be quite productive. So it's kind of the misfit of the ideals of the values of the architect, the client, and the contractor that is precisely the most interesting part about that relationship in the most conventional sense. So like to kind of blow it up to like the big historic view of what is the architect, you know, it's, this is going to sound kind of big and, and antiquated, but like philosopher, sage, mason, all of those things combined. Um, and I, I actually think that's really true. I, I look at that and of course I'm going to go to history. I love doing that, but I, I think that the academy right now is looking at architecture as philosopher. Um, the industry is looking to architect as Mason, at least for the last 30 years. And 
the sage part has kind of been ignored. So I would translate sage into something else and maybe say it's sort of the mediator, somebody that can actually deliver the message and interpolate between the two. That's the real meat of it. Like the, the having good work, that's the conceit. Okay, if you are an architect, you have to produce something good. And we, we can talk about what is good and what isn't, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, and probably not for today, but um, it, it's, the, it's the mediation of those things that's relevant. So I think that's something that's missing now. So at a sort of in contrast of what Karen is doing, which is really impressive and kind of addressing things at a macro communal scale, um, we're, we're trying to do things at the micro scale and running back to the things that architects have been giving away sort of in the last 20 years, let's say. So we like entitlements. We like permitting things. We like the bureaucracy of the city. We find that there's ways to interpret code and manipulate, um, uh, maybe even manipulate code a little bit and achieve things that can speak to densification in the code and embedded in these kind of mandates. So we want to be involved in all of that. We want to be involved in the project from beginning to end. And so that kind of broad arching view of architect is something that resonates with, with me very deeply. I, I didn't answer that question at all, by the way. I just no, I think said what did. I wanted to say. I thought it was great. <laughs> great answer. Okay. Um, so just um, another maybe more specific question from Cam from the Jumpstart program. Um, they were curious about your thoughts about densification and what the biggest obstacles um, currently are in regards to densification and how architects specifically um, can work with or around or overcome these obstacles. I think, Karen, you talked a bit about working with the city. So maybe that's how you guys do that. Well, the, I think the biggest obstacle is that people are afraid of change, period. Right, so everyone is absolutely petrified. When they hear densification, they just have all their own misconceptions of what that means. And I think it's, it, you know, architects showing what densification can be and how it can be good is, is part of our job. It's hard for us to find opportunities to do that. And that's what was so great about that competition. I just really hope that with that competition that the mayor's office, hit, their, their plan is to kind of bring it out into the community, be doing presentations. And that's why ours is also very like, like normal looking, you know, like it's, it's very, yeah, you could picture this next to your house and it'd be okay because that's literally how to, how to get that change going. And then once that change gets going, the other, the other um, entry that we won was much more architectural, um, but that one was more about how to subdivide uh, a lot, right? So it was much more average looking, which I think is important to start to sell it to, um, mainstream and then and then it can amp up to really become something more. I, I totally agree with that. And, and maybe actually, Karen, in this sense, we're not so different in our strategies and approaches. We're, I only briefly touched on the hillside research that we're really involved in and really interested in uh, these days. But I, I, for us, it's like the recognition that number one, we need space. And we need space that's affordable. And so that occurs at the fringe, it occurs in hillside properties that have been overlooked. Some that can't be easily accessed without a significant intervention that triggers all kinds of red, red tape and bureaucracy. And then it's the optics of going through all of that that are relevant. And this is where I think I, I totally agree with Karen. Um, it's the optics of that change and that kind of, there's lots of good ideas out there for how to accomplish this, but that's the big challenge. So one example of this is like to, um, to tie lots or produce common green space or common infrastructural elements in hillside lots, the optics for the city need to be that of producing atomized individual residential units. That's what the city is comfortable with. Anything that, that kind of violates that, unless it falls into a very specific category, starts to raise red flags and makes uh, difficulty for permitting and entitlements. For the neighborhood, the optics or the, let's say the interests are, could be very different. And there's a conflict there. There's one version is we don't want a big house on the neighborhood, a big fancy architectural house. Another version is we need a house of a particular kind of quality and size because it will impact, impact property values. So there's this constant 
delivery of something that in one sense has to appeal to the city and in another sense has to appeal to the to the neighborhood and we're finding that that's possible to do both in very kind of clever ways but you're always sort of delivering a, a wolf in sheep's clothing you like you have multiple agendas and they're they're sometimes in conflict um at least in this current system uh with the city and and, and with respect to the neighborhood of the clients yeah Quick, a question for Karen from Olivia. Um, she's wondering, how are you able to focus on design of all aspects and found your company on your own terms, especially when you work at such a big scale? Well, when it was just me, right? I was doing everything, but it was just me and the projects were very small. Um, and now that's what I'm saying. I, I, I do very little design. And in fact, I'm not even involved in the projects that much. Um, I usually do more of the, I've realized I'm more of the vision person, like I see where it needs to go. Um, and you know, when you get just naturally, when you have a firm that's, a, um, you know, and it's not a big firm, but it's a lot still 40, um, you, it's very hard unless you have other partners that are bringing in all the work, basically almost all of your time is bringing in work. So that's where I spend a lot of my time. I can't even speak to that question that way. Um, except to say that time management is like, your time is a commodity and you, there's a fixed, it's the biggest asset. You have to be very, very disciplined about how you spend it and where you're going to spend it and you can't do it all. It's a constant moving target and it involves kind of rethinking. There's times when, you know, um, looking for work and marketing is important and cycles where the execution is important. And don't forget, I would say to some of the students that you're seeing images of architecture, but a lot of these things break over a three to five year cycle. So there is the finding the client, there is the designing the project, there is the entitlements, and then you have three or four or 10 of these cooking at any given moment. You just oscillate between very different roles. So it's the, your, your comfort and ability to change hats and take on very different roles is critical to all of that. Yeah, thank you. So maybe one um, last question about visualization um, and how you show your projects to clients. I think for Ben, this is I, I would personally be really interested because a lot of your drawings and your visualizations are very architectural. And I'm wondering how do you use those same drawings to communicate to your clients? Or what is that process? And how do you see that moving forward? Um, do you guys use VR or anything like that? Uh, our version of VR is a camera and a light bulb and a model. Um, and we, we like that. We like the analog. We like um, a very specific use of technology. Um, it's a good question. And it's an endless conversation in the office. I'll try to kind of answer it briefly. I would love a drawing that does it all. It doesn't exist. It, it simply doesn't. It can't. Um, and, and increasingly, we're okay with kind of a heterogeneous collection of output, what you saw were like very architectural academic drawings. They're meant to communicate an intention. A construction document is meant, it's not how to put a building together, by the way, in my opinion, it's meant to tell a story about how to put a building together. Those are two very different things. Um, the one thing that I think that uh, is kind of universal has always been, and it's funny because it's such an architectural, a classic architectural fixture is the model. Everybody gets it. The client gets it, the contractor gets it, the architect gets it, it speaks to almost everyone. So we rely on that heavily because we found that it, it it's just like a, a really good tool. It is the mediator that I was referring to. The, the, say, it's, the model is the sage that allows the academic to um, interact or the academic agenda to kind of be reconciled against the agenda of a contractor, of a project manager, of a financier, et cetera. Okay, great. So I think we are perfectly on time <laughs> at the end of that question. Um, thank you both so much for coming and speaking with us. It was really great um, to hear what you have to say, uh, Yulia. I would also like to thank uh, Ben and Karin for joining us today. I think uh, this was really exciting to see both of your work and get an insight into the kind of experiences since you graduated from UCLA both and kind of your uh, ongoing and continuing affiliation to UCLA and getting an insight and kind of networking with the students 
thanks so much both to you for your time and um, really appreciated meeting you, Karen, as well. And uh, yeah, hope to stay in touch in the future and uh, reconnect. Nice to meet you, Karen, as well. Like really super interesting work that we've been watching from the outside. It's nice to see it from the inside as well, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was a great opportunity and really fun to be back at UCLA. I really haven't been involved so much in the last few decades. So this is great. And, and for the students come to UCLA, there are like so many interesting people are at UCLA. Exactly. <laughs> like I'm going to just, I'm just going to plug it. It's great. It's such a good place to go to school. Go, yes. go there. And I was, my efforts were really to kind of bring as many different people together. And it, it's already now in the three day, in the last three days, like seeing all the different kind of work is really exciting uh, to meet, for me also to meet the alumni from UCLA. Uh, having taught there now since uh, 2012, I only know the people since then and kind of meeting, meeting others is also really great. So thanks again for your time and, uh, and hope to see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye. Okay.